Okay. Welcome. My name is Divine. I am a resident. This is episode 204 of the Divine Intervention Podcasts. And in today's podcast, I am going to be focusing on the USMLE and the military. I know some of you listening to this may be alarmed. You may be like, hmm, Divine, USMLE and the military. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. The thing is, um, one thing I guess I will go ahead and say is uh, when you're studying for an exam, it usually helps to look up like the learning objectives or the content outline for that exam you're studying for. It's just usually a smart thing to do, just in general, right? Um, I notice it's it's extremely rare to hear people say, oh, you know, I went through the USMLE content outline and almost like mentally checked off that I knew most of the information on it. Yes, you know, they test certain bits of information more than others, but I always find it really helpful to look at the outline because the thing is, when you look at the outline, um, I mean, obviously, again, it's not everything they test that will be in said outlines, but the thing is, those outlines can give you a very nice, clear indication of things you may want to pay attention to so that you don't get any unusual surprises as you're studying for the exam. Like literally, this first part of my presentation, it literally comes straight out of the content outline, right? You can see it says, oh, this outline provides a common organization of content across all USMLE examinations. Each step exam will emphasize certain parts of the outline and no single examination will include questions on all topics in the outline. The examples listed within the outline are just that, examples. Questions may include diseases, symptoms, etc., that are not included in the outline. The USMLE program, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's go to the relevant part. So, as practice guidelines evolve or are introduced, the content on USMLE is reviewed and modified as needed. At times, there is a change in emphasis on new content development that arises from our ongoing peer review process. For example, there has been an emphasis on new content developed assessing competencies related to geriatric medicine, that's going to be a future podcast, and prescription drug use and abuse. I have a lot of stuff on those, but that's probably also going to be a future podcast. Now, here's the key part. USMLE has also focused recent efforts on the often unrecognized healthcare needs of recently returning servicemen and servicewomen. For example, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder, and the families of deployed servicemen and servicewomen. While many of the medical issues related to the healthcare of these special populations are not unique, certain medical illnesses or conditions are either more prevalent, have a different presentation, or are managed differently. Knowledge of foundational science and clinical science in these content areas will be assessed on the USMLE Step 1, 2CK, and Step 3 examinations, right? So that is literally the purpose behind this podcast. I'm essentially going to deal with the part of this. And again, this is not like some secret document I have or anything. No. If you literally do a Google search for USMLE content outline, you'll see this, I think, on page 2 of their content outline, believe it or not, right? So the thing is, today I'm going to focus on military medicine as relevant to the USMLE exams. Again, if the NBME put this in their content outline, it means it is going to show up on your exam, right? So this is a podcast you absolutely want to pay attention to. I hope to make it really short, but this is a very high yield podcast that I will say at least contains a, a decent amount of new knowledge that you'd find to be helpful on these exams, especially like step two CK and step three. So, and I guess the first thing I want to start with is if you're in the military or if you're in, in any of the forces, you're like in, in the police, you're a firefighter or anything like that, really thank you for your service. Uh, regardless of whatever is out there, I, we, I know we as a country appreciate your service. You're a blessing to this country. And personally, myself, I thank you, every person in the military, in the Navy, in the Air Force, in the Army. Thank you for your service. I mean, I have been blessed by people in the in the military before right so again i just really thank you for everything you do um what you do is is not uh it's not easy by any stretch and it's not um it it, it would not go unrewarded so really thank you and god bless you for everything that you do so let's jump right into it right so the first topic i'm going to go ahead and talk about here is traumatic brain injury 
So you may ask yourself, okay, divine, well, what is traumatic brain injury? And I'm going to call it TBI going forward, right? So what is TBI? Basically, TBI is anything that happens when you have like an external force that kind of like impacts the brain, right? So, you know, when you have those external forces, you'll have like these acceleration and acceleration injuries that ultimately develop, right? So the thing is you want to differentiate a TBI from like any other kind of brain injury because there is traumatic brain injury, which is what we're focusing on today. And then there is also such a thing as a non-traumatic brain injury, right? So like an NTBI, an NTBI if you may, right? So the thing is, a non-traumatic brain injury is something where it's more internal that gives rise to the brain problem, right? So for example, if a person has meningitis, right? If a person has a stroke, right? That is not an external force. It's not like something external is impacting the brain and anything like that, no, right? It's an internal problem, right? And the thing is, traumatic brain injury is very common in the military, but it's also common in sports, right? Like, so for example, if you look at... Um, like this thing that they call a chronic traumatic encephalopathy amongst like football players, people that engage in wrestling, WWE and things like that, right? Those are all examples of traumatic brain injury, right? Those are all examples of traumatic brain injury. Now, what are the relevant things you want to keep at the back of your mind with respect to the USMLE exams? The first thing is, are there some preventive measures that could be used uh, for traumatic brain injury? Well, the thing is, my discussion will be kind of scattered, right? Because this, the information for this podcast, I kind of had to call it from many different resources, right? So, you know, I'll kind of talk of my information scattered. So pardon me, but again, this podcast will contain the vast majority of the high yield stuff you need to know, right? So what are some things you can do as prevention? Well, some things you can do is you can consider using like seat belts, right? Seat belts really decrease a person's risk of being a victim of traumatic brain injury and also wearing helmets, right? I mean, if you notice uh, the NFL in the US, right? A ton of people use helmets, right? Those things are all preventive to decrease the person's risk of traumatic brain injury, right? And I will talk about some preventive measures specific to the military as I go along. And obviously, traumatic brain injury is a lot more common in males than females, right? So that's a high yield thing to know. They can easily make that an epidemiologic question on the exam, right? Now, the thing is, it is very important to know how to classify TBIs on an MBM exam, right? Um, you want to be able to grade them by severity, right? And this is where the Glasgow Coma Scale comes into play, right? The Glasgow Coma Scale, I believe I talked about it in my surgery video or something like that. If I didn't talk about it in that video, I would strongly encourage you to look it up. This is something you actually have to commit to memory because TBIs are graded commonly according to the Glasgow Coma Scale. Right. So if, for example, your GCS score is 13 or higher, right, that's a mild TBI. Another name for a mild TBI is a concussion. OK, now, if your GCS is from 9 to 12, then you're said to have a moderate traumatic brain injury. And then I want to make sure this mic is uh, on and everything. OK, perfect. So but if you have a GCS that is eight or lower, right, that's severe TBI. And obviously, the lower your GCS, the very likely the worse your outcomes, right? And the pathologic hallmark of TBIs is just diffuse axonal injury, right? Like if you look at it under like, you know, like histology or you take like postmortem examples, you see diffuse axonal injury, even on imaging, especially if you use certain like MRI sequences, you don't need to worry about the, that, uh, like diffusion tensor Im uh, uh, imaging and all that stuff. You can actually see like that diffuse axonal injury. It's a pathognomonic uh pathologic feature of uh, TBIs. Now, the thing is, if they ask you on a test, right, the thing, because the MBME, right, when they are talking about neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders, they care quite a bit about neuroanatomical relationships, right? So, for example, if you remember from my psych video where I talk about how um, schizophrenia is associated with like a big size of the lateral ventricles or Alzheimer's disease is associated with, uh, dis with dysfunction, of the basal nucleus of Minert or decreased activity of choline acetyltransferase. Well, TBI has some neuroanatomical relationships that you'd want to keep at the back of your mind for exams, right? So, for example, if a person has TBI, right, like the parts of the brain that are most susceptible to damage, right, are the anterior temporal lobes. And then there's a part of the cortex called the orbitofrontal cortex. I'll say that again. The anterior temporal lobes and the orbitofrontal cortex are the most likely regions of the brain to, I guess, let me put it this way, they are most susceptible to damage in the setting of a traumatic brain injury. Now, the thing is, 
when a person has a TBI, especially when it's a particularly bad one, right, they can have signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, right? And one thing your friends at the MBME can do to clue you into the person likely having increased ICP is they will give you like the Cushing's reflex. Obviously, they won't say, oh, this patient presents with bradycardia, hypertension, and respiratory depression. No, they're not going to do that, right? No smart person will do that. They will give you actual vital signs, right? You know, they will give you like a respiratory rate of like six per minute, and they will give you like a blood pressure of like 180 over 120, and then they will tell you that, oh, this person has a, like a heart rate of like in the low 40s or something like that. Or they can even show you an EKG where the person is in sinus, but the person is in sinus bradycardia, right? So those are all things your friends at the MBME could do to you, right? So be watchful or be vigilant of those signs of increased intracranial pressures on MBME exams. Now, the thing is usually, right, when a person has a TBI, right, the first, it's usually in an emergency setting, usually your first diagnostic test is to go ahead and perform a CT of the head, although the CT of the head does not give you as much information as an MRI, right, so if you don't see CT as an answer choice, go ahead and go with uh, MRI. Just choose MRI, don't worry about the sequence, that's more radiology speak, that's not something you should be concerned about uh, taking the exam. Now, this is the f one other high yield thing to know, right? So the thing is, uh, N-acetylcysteine has actually been shown to be very helpful in preventing like sequelae of uh, for traumatic brain injury, right? Um, it has been shown to be a preventive measure, ex especially in the military, right? So if you get an exam question about a person that's a victim of TBI, right? And then they say, oh, which of the following is the next best step in management as a preventive measure, right? You want to go ahead and administer N-acetylcysteine. I'd imagine that it probably has something to do with like preventing free radical damage in the brain or something like that. I didn't really dig much into the mechanisms on that. And again, like I said, I may have more military medicine podcasts in the future. I will certainly have a geriatric podcast in the very near future. Because again, as you can see from the outline, those things are very important and high yield to know, right? So, uh, n acetylcysteine is a very nice uh, preventive measure. And then the thing is, within the first three hours of the person suffering that traumatic brain injury, you also want to give something known as tranexamic acid, right? Like many times in the hospital, that's what's known as TXA. Surgeons refer to it as TXA, TXA, TXA. Tranexamic acid should be given within the first three hours of a traumatic brain injury to decrease the risk of death. And the thing is, if a person has, you know, like elevated intracranial pressures, I mean, there are some high yield things you want to do, right? So, you know, you'd want to, you know, adjust the head of the bed, right? So that uh, they can have like more blood perfusion to the brain and they have like less of a risk of herniation, right? Another thing you would want to do is, you know, you could also consider uh, like hyperventilation, right? In fact, the quickest means, this is very high yield to know, the quickest means of acutely lowering intracranial pressures is hyperventilation. But it is absolutely important to realize that hyperventilation is a short term measure. It's not something you want to do long term, right? Because remember, hyperventilation causes, uh, you know, it decreases the uh, carbon dioxide uh, tension in your in your blood, right? And your CSF, right? So that causes like a cerebral visual constriction, right? So that can ultimately cause brain ischemia. So the thing is, if a person is like, you know, cramping in front of you, they're about to die kind of deal, you hook them up to a venti like to a ventilator. Obviously, if a person ha is a victim of TBI, uh, especially if it's like a really bad TBI, right? They need to be put on a, they need to get like an endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. But as you do that, you crank up the respiratory rate so you can blow off CO2 so that you can decrease the intracranial pressures. But again, that's not something you want to do for days and days on end. No, that will not be prudent because that cerebral vasoconstriction can cause cerebral ischemia and then the person dies or gets even more devastating neurologic injury, right? So you absolutely do not just want to do hyperventilation forever, right? But, you know, you want to do it for the first few hours to acutely lower that person's intracranial pressure. Now, remember, there are other things you can use, right? So you can use like mannitol. Remember, mannitol, you want to be careful in people that have a history of like CHF, right? You can also use hypertonic saline. But again, remember, hypertonic saline, be very careful of a dangerous hypernatremia that can develop, right? But those are all things you could potentially do to decrease a person's intracranial pressures. Now, one common trick answer that you may see on the MBME with regards to, oh, we should do this for a traumatic brain injury is to give IV corticosteroids Listen to me here. Do not give, because many people think of it, oh, if a person has elevated ICPs, I can give steroids to decrease the swelling. The thing is, when people have a traumatic brain injury, the mechanism of injury is different, right? So when a person has a TBI, you absolutely, on your MBME exams, should not give corticosteroids, right? Corticosteroids have actually been shown to increase the risk of death 
in the setting of a traumatic brain injury. That's something very high yield. You want to make sure you know for exams, right? And then the thing is, in general, when people suffer a TBI, you want to keep them at normal body temperature, right? Don't make them hyperthermic. If they're hyperthermic, right, then they're, their brain's metabolic activity will increase, right? And again, you're already dealing with a brain that cannot deal with much. I almost think of it this way, right? So say, for example, right, like, you know, if you have savings in the bank, right? You know, if the economy collapses, you're probably going to be fine. You're not going to have too many issues, right? But let's assume you're living like paycheck to paycheck, right? If the economy collapses and you lose your job, you're screwed, right? So the thing is, when a person has a traumatic brain injury, the brain has very minimal reserve, right? So usually, the smart thing to do is to not make them hyperthermic. Although, from the literature research I did, uh, there does not appear to be any benefits to making those people hypothermic, right? But certainly, and again, I'm just talking about TBIs, right? I mean, like, there are certain cardiovascular maladies that respond really well to to like a hypothermic protocol. But in general, you just want to keep people that are victims of TBI normothermic, normothermic right? Uh, so that, again, you don't increase the metabolic needs of your brain because, again, their brains do not have much in the way of reserve. And then, if a person, for example, from a TBI, they have like a hematoma in the brain, right? The, your next step in management is, you know, call your surgery, do a decompressive uh, craniectomy, right? That's a high yield thing you'd want to do on an exam. Right. And then the thing is, when a person is getting out of, you know, after the acute phase of hospitalization, uh, they need some kind of rehab. Right. So usually you send them to like some kind of rehabilitation facility. Again, you may say, hmm, Divine, why are you going over this stuff? The thing is, the MBME, they may just give you a question about a person that, you know, they'll give you. I mean, you've, you hear people say of these questions where they're like, oh, you know, I was reading a question. I was like, oh, I know exactly what they're talking about. And then you see the question they ask you at the end. And you see the answer choices and you're like scratching your head. You're like, what? Right. So that is one thing that can happen on these exams. Right. So after a person gets acute hospitalization, they need to be sent to a, re to a rehabilitation uh, facility. Right. And then and usually it's some kind of like subacute rehabilitation facility that they get sent to. Right. And then um, if you remember my MBME weird podcast where I talk about like prognostic factors, most common causes of death and all that stuff. And by the way, if you're taking any of these USMLE exams, you really should listen to episodes 37, episodes 97, and episodes 184. And then there's a social sciences podcast that I have that's very high yield to know for purposes of exams. So the thing is, um, um, the biggest prognostic factor after a person gets a traumatic brain injury is really the severity of initial injury, right? So obviously a person will have a much worse prognosis if they have a severe TBI compared to a person that has a mild TBI. And they can even give you like elect like a nef like a diabetes insipidus question. It'll, it'll be more so like a central diabetes insipidus question when a person has a TBI, right? So you know if they give you a question about a person that is hypernatremic after a traumatic brain injury, and then they have like a urine that has very low specific gravity or urine that has um, you know that is not very concentrated that has a very low osmolality, then you absolutely want to think about a central diabetes insipidus developing under those uh, circumstances, and then. Um, one other thing you may get tested with on an exam is they may ask you like, oh, what is the most common cognitive impairment that arises after a person uh, develops a traumatic brain injury? It's almost always memory loss, okay? Memory loss, very high yield, is the most common cognitive impairment that develops after a person suffers a traumatic brain injury. Now, what if they give you an MBME question and they tell you that, oh, this person had like a mild TBI, maybe their GCS was like 14 or something like that. And then they tell you that, you know, like this person after like four days after they're getting like uh, or days or even weeks after or even months after, believe it or not, they're having like chronic headaches. They feel dizzy all the time. They have like this increased sensitivity to like light and loud noises. Um, what should your diagnosis be under those circumstances? I would really hope you're thinking about something called post-concussive syndrome. OK, post-concussive syndrome. Right. Um, again, it's if you see a person having like a lot of like neuropsych problems like headaches, that's probably the most common one you see on exams. So headaches, dizziness, um, problems with sleep, increased sensitivity to lights and sounds, anxiety, depression, agitation, irritability. Again, after a mild traumatic brain injury, think about something called a post-concussive syndrome. And then one closely related disorder that your friends at the MBME could test you on is they could ask you about a person. They could say, oh, this person suffered like a mild TBI, like, you know, like maybe like two weeks ago or something, right? And, you know, they are still in the recovery phase from that TBI. And then they suffer like another TBI. And then they tell you that, oh, this person just 
crashes, deteriorates, and subsequently passes away or becomes like persistently vegetative or anything like that. If you see that, you want to think about something called the second impact syndrome. I'll say that again, the second impact syndrome, okay? Basically, if you're recovering from a traumatic brain injury and then you get a superimposed one, uh, those people can actually have pretty bad outcomes under those uh, circumstances. So personally, I think those are all the big things, high yield things I want to talk about in regards to TBI. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the next topic, right? So the next topic is PTSD, right? So again, I know you may say, oh, Divine, I've heard about PTSD from your psych video. Yes, you've heard about PTSD from my psych video. But the thing is, again, specifically to the military, there's a few more high yield things that you want to keep at the back of your mind for purposes of the MBME exams, right? So the first one is, PTSD is very common in like deployed veterans, right? Especially like veterans that again, return from military duty. In fact, like if you read the literature about like one in four veterans um, end, up having a, end up having PTSD. And the thing is, the problem with PTSD is not just the PTSD that's the problem. Besides the PTSD, they also tend to have like other comorbidities, right? Like they can have like alcohol abuse, right? That's actually one of the most common comorbidities that's associated with PTSD in returning uh, servicemen and service women, right? So that's something you want to keep at the back of your mind on exams. And I'll say more about that as we go along, right? So how do you treat this PTSD? The thing is PTSD treatment is divided into two major parts for servicemen and women, right? On MBME exams. The first one is pharmacological therapy. Right. So the thing is, pharmacological therapy will be SSRIs. Right. And for the most part, the ones that probably have the most inf like most uh, data behind them are drugs like sertraline. Right. And fluoxetine and peroxetine. Also, the SNRI, then lafaxine, has also been shown to help in PTSD, especially again in the in uh, military uh, servicemen and uh, women. Right. And then. Um, Remember, though, like how does PTSD usually present, right? So usually people that have PTSD, they'll have like distressing thoughts like related to like to a, like a bad event that they experience, you know, like maybe being stuck in a battlefield or a bunch of their people in their cohort died in battle or something like that, right? And then they will have like distress whenever they see like any cues, right? So let's say a person sees an accident, right? They see that accident and it triggers memory of like their Humvee blowing up or something like that right? That can trigger like distress, right? And then usually those people also tend to have like autonomic hyperactivity whenever they have these symptoms. So their heart rate may go up, their respiratory rate may go up, right? Their blood pressure may go up, right? Those are all things that are classic for, for PTSD, right? And then these people also tend to like try to avoid those triggers as much as is possible. And they, I mean, you can't blame them, right? They avoid these triggers because it spurs many of these distressing thoughts, distressing emotions, distressing autonomic reactions to whatever is going on, right? And uh, one thing I will go ahead and say is, again, this can be a very unique MBME question. The thing is, people that have PTSD, like, PTSD is more common when you have the trauma arise as a result of an interpersonal circumstance as against, um, like, let's say, like a natural disaster or anything like that. In fact, like, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example, right? Like, one of the most common psychiatric comorbidities that arises after rape is PTSD. In fact, P uh, rape is one of the, like being a victim of rape is one of the most common causes of PTSD in the US, right? So interpersonal like trauma, right, is a bigger risk factor for PTSD in comparison with uh, like natural disaster trauma. Again, I'm not belittling those, but I'm just telling you what is more common. And again, it's very high yield to know that for the purposes of exams. Now, the thing is, for you to say a person has PTSD, you need to have these symptoms I've just described for more than a month, okay? If they have these symptoms for less than a month, it is called acute stress disorder, okay? It is called acute stress disorder. Why is that important? The, the reason that's important is because you do not, I'll say this again, this is very high yield to know, you absolutely do not give SSRIs for acute stress disorder. Acute stress disorder, for the most part, you know, you can do psychotherapy or whatever, right? But like the full-on pharmacologic PTSD treatment, does not apply to acute stress disorder. Again, this is something that is very high yield to know for the purposes of the USMLE exams. And then another thing you may see with PTSD is um, like nightmares, right? You can give prazosin to actually help with uh, uh, treating the nightmares that are associated with PTSD. Now, what is one big area that your friends at the MBME really care about with regards to PTSD, again, especially in the military? One big area that they really care about is the CBT, that is used for uh, for um, PTSD, right? The thing is, there are many C CBT techniques, but the thing is, the MBME kind of expects you to know what some of these uh, 
CBT methods entail. And the classic ones you want to keep at the back of your mind, at least these buzzwords you want to recognize on your exams, you want to recognize things like exposure therapy. Sometimes they call it prolonged exposure therapy, especially when you're referring to PTSD. Essentially, you expose those people to the thing that triggered their PTSD in the first place, but you expose it to them in a non-harming environment. You expose it without the goal of harm, right? You're just trying to make them a little more comfortable with the events that surrounded whatever triggered their PTSD in the first place, right? And the thing is, exposure therapy will also be the right answer, like the right CBT answer for psychotherapy. In an MBME exam question that talks about OCD, right? So like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, generalized anxiety disorder, and also phobias, right? Phobias are probably one of the more common ones as well on MBME exams for that, right? And then another thing that is usually done is um, uh, something called cognitive processing therapy, right? Basically, those patients face and discuss the events in detail, right? And then you then work little by little with a therapist, right, to begin to ad address like maladaptive thoughts and maladaptive responses that you, it's mostly a thought-based therapy, right? Like maladaptive thoughts relating to the event, you try to work on those uh, from that perspective. And then there's another one that's, I feel like this is unlikely to show up on the MBM exam, but just for the sake of completeness, I'll talk about it. It's something called, it's like eye movement therapy. Uh, you can look it up online, but I don't see that as something that the MBM may put too much stock in, right? Uh, but definitely exposure therapy, cognitive processing therapy, those are things you definitely want to know for purposes of your exams. Now, the thing is, again, like I said, alcohol abuse is a very common comorbidity in people that have a PTSD, right? And again, uh, people that have PTSD should not get benzos, right? Do not give them benzos. Benzodiazepines have actually been shown to worsen outcomes in veterans that have a PTSD, right? Now, again, going back to this whole neuroanatomical business that the MBME wants you to know, right? I'll go ahead and mention a few things here. The thing is, people that have PTSD tend to have a smaller volume of the hippocampus, okay? That's a high yield thing to know, right? And people that also have PTSD, they tend to have an exaggerated response to something called like the dexamethasone suppression test, right? So I'll just make up numbers here, right? So let's say you give a person dexamethasone. I mean, obviously that will suppress a person's CRH and ACTH, right? So let's say, oh, the suppressed cortisol level you get after the test is like 10, right? People that have PTSD may have like a cortisol level of 1, right? So they have a, like a higher than normal response, right? An exaggerated response to the dexamethasone suppression test, right? And usually these people, right, if you check their urine, they actually tend to have pretty low levels of, in fact, to be honest with you, I think of PTSD as a maladaptive hyperadrenergic response, right? Because usually, right, when a person undergoes a stressor, right, let's say, I don't know, you're preparing for the USMLE exams, for example, or you're being chased by a lion or something like that, right? Your catecholamines would rise, but at the same time, your cortisol would rise because cortisol would, you know, it's a diabetogenic hormone. It'll raise your blood glucose levels. It'll have this permissive effect on the sympathetic nervous system to make you better able to adjust to that stress, right? So again, usually whenever you're stressed or you go through a traumatic, like a, you know, like a, heart shaking event, right? You have increased levels of catecholamines and increased levels of cortisol, or you can say glucocorticoids in your urine. That is not the case with PTSD. People that have PTSD, they, and if you check their urine, they tend to have elevated levels of catecholamines, and then they tend to have abnormally low levels of cortisol, right? So you're like, hmm, is it because they have low levels of cortisol? Is that why they are not able to adjust to those uh, problems that they get from, again, the hyperadrenergic response when they have these uh, PTSD episodes, right? So who knows? That's food for thought, right? That's something. But definitely know the part about the abnormally low levels of cortisol and high levels of catecholamines in the urine in people that have PTSD. Again, that is absolutely something that your friends at the MBME could test on an exam. And again, for the most part, the way PTSD happens, at least if you're thinking more pathophysiology, you get a traumatic event, right? You get a hyperadrenergic response that's maladaptive. And then when you get future episodes of that same event, you still have to keep having those maladaptive responses. It's almost like the person's brain is rewi rewired to respond to those kinds of situations in, uh, in an abnormal way. And again, it's no fault of theirs. Again, these are people that have been through major trauma in life. And again, PTSD, you don't have to go through major trauma in life to have PTSD. Uh, minor trauma can actually be the cause of, uh, can actually be the cause of PTSD. And I mean, like if you have like early access to like these psychotherapies, like CBT may actually help and maybe like decrease the person's ultimate severity of their PTSD. 
And then one thing that uh, you do not want to pick on an MBM exam as treatment for PTSD is uh, debriefing, right? Debriefing has actually not been shown to be helpful. In fact, in some studies, it has actually been shown to be pretty harmful, right? So debriefing is not going to be the right answer on an MBM exam with regards to the treatment of PTSD. Um, so I guess... Yeah, I think that's pretty much all I want to say about PTSD. The remaining topics I have here, they're pretty short. Uh, in fact, I'm almost done with this podcast, right? One other thing you want to be aware of, maybe just at least know a few things about, is something called military sexual trauma, right? So military sexual trauma is basically any kind of sexual harassment or sexual assault that occurs to a person that's in the military, right? And the reason you want to know about that is it is one of the biggest risk factors for PTSD on an MBME exam. Right? is one of the biggest risk factors for PTSD, PTSD. again, especially amongst uh, military servicemen and women. Right, And the thing is, military sexual trauma, you can probably predict this already, is a lot more common in uh, women than men. Okay, It's a lot more common in women than men. And that's pretty much all I think I'm going to say about military sexual trauma. And then you want to know about some common problems that can happen in like with uh, families of like deployed servicemen and service women. So what are those things you want to know? Right. The thing is, being a family member of like at least a common let me put, put, let me put it this way. Right. Being a family member of a deployed serviceman or woman, it's associated with uh, having like poor mental health in the family. It's associated with like behavioral like problems in the children. Right. It's associated with like higher rates of divorce, higher rates of suicide. Right. So, again, these are all things you just want to keep in mind for the U.S. families. Right. And there are some critical factors that can actually increase your chances of a better outcome, or I guess like a better family response to being deployed, right? And the two critical ones you want to keep at the back of your mind for exams are things like preparation prior to deployment. So, you know, things like getting life insurance before you're deployed or, um, you know, just sort of setting measures in place, like an emergency fund and things like that, that has been associated with better outcomes, right? And a better response to being deployed on the part of the, you know, like making a military family like more resilient. Although to be honest with you, just, so this is just personal observation. I feel like just in general, military families are more resilient than the average family. I'll just go ahead and throw that, throw that out there, right? And then the second critical factor is increased levels of communication while the service member is deployed, right? So, you know, if you have like more communication with your family, right? Well, I mean, just think of it, right? In any relationship, not even in like a relationship between like a military spouse, uh, like between like military spouses or whatever, just in any relationship in life, communication is the bedrock of any successful relationship, right? And then um, about a third of the kids of deployed veterans, again, they tend to they have like, they have like, you know, like a higher incidence of like depression, of anxiety, of behavioral problems, right? So again, those are all things to keep in mind. And then to round up, I guess, um, let me just say a few like more like weird things that, you know, they don't really fit into any of these topics, but they're kind of important to know. Remember, homelessness is also a big problem amongst the veterans, right? It's like, uh, if you compare like a deplo- like uh, a veteran, right? To like the, like a non, like a deployed veteran to like a non-deployed veteran, right? Uh, amongst men, the, amongst men and women uniformly, there is a much higher rate of homelessness, especially like in the female population. Believe it or not, right? And the thing is, the most common this is very high yield. The most common comorbidity in a person that is a uh, homeless veteran, it's actually like a substance use disorder, right? Substance use disorder. The vast majority of these people, the substance in in question is uh, tends to be uh, alcohol. Right, it tends to be alcohol, right? And um, you know, these people also have a pretty high incidence of PTSD. I think there was like a uh, like a thing I read, like an article I read that said I think as high as like forty five percent of like homeless veterans have PTSD, right? So wherever you can, if you can contribute and you know just help out or volunteer in programs that are targeted towards helping our veterans. Because, I mean, these people are going out of their way, right? Selfless service, they are going out. Usually, they are traveling to, like, distant places to help this country, right? You know, just do your best for them, right? Because they're going out to protect you, right? We should also try to protect them ourselves in whatever little way that we can. And then, um, it's actually kind of high yield to know that problems, like these, like, psychiatric problems that arises, arise in military uh, service members, right? It actually tends to peak many decades after they've been exposed to the trauma in question, 
right? And again, there is a very high incidence of like suicide and suicidal ideation amongst military members that have PTSD, right? Uh, it's, and it's even the the risk is even higher when they have like other comorbidities in addition to their PTSD. And as I do at the end of every podcast, I do offer one-on-one tutoring for many exams, right? So step one, step two CK, step two CS, step three, uh, preclinical med school exams, third year shelf exams. Um, if you're a medicine resident, right? So I tutor for the ABIM board exam, the internal medicine in training exam. And then if you're a college student and you need tutoring for like general chemistry, organic chemistry, physics, biochemistry, histology, physiology, alpha tutoring for all those things. If you're interested in any of those things, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I also do these booster courses for the USMLEs. It's like 20 hours for step one. And it's um, it's actually now 15 hours for step two CK and step three. I'm beginning to incorporate some new content into these uh, sessions, right? So it's now 15 hours for step two CK and step three, and it's 20 hours for step one, right? Um, if you're interested in any of those things, reach out to me. And then uh, I also offer like these large group uh, USMLE comprehensive courses. It's pr- probably runs for about 100 hours. Um, the thing is for that to happen, you need a group of five to seven people and a location, right? Um, and then I also offer co- like coaching, right? So if you're like a med student applying to residency, so like an ERAS application or a college student applying to med school, so like an AMCAS application, I do offer like one-on-one consulting with regards to like personal statement editing, application editing, rec letters, mock interviews, things like that. Again, the vast majority of people I've worked with have all matched their first choice. And again, I have like uh, one year's worth of like very intense experience with an admissions committee of a top two med school, right? So um, again, if you're interested in any of these things, either reach out to me through the website or send me an email at divine intervention podcasts with an S at the end at gmail.com. And then uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Again, just it's called like divine intervention podcasts and videos. Um, Subscribe to the Apple podcast. Uh, I also have this on Spotify podcasts on Google Play, right? And also just the WordPress website, please subscribe. And any valuable feedback that you can leave is always appreciated. And again, like I say, if you have any particular podcast you want me to make, just reach out to me, right? Um, Again, if I have the time and I see it's a reasonable request and I get requests from many people on a particular topic, I'll go ahead and make the podcast. I mean, many of the podcasts I've made have just been from people saying, oh, Divine, would it be possible for you to make a podcast on this specific topic? So thank you for listening. And again, please listen to this podcast. This is something that is very high yield to know because again, the USMLE cares about the military, which they should actually um, on their new exams, right? So again, just something to keep at the back of your mind. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And again, if you're in the military, remember your service is not unwarranted. Your service is not unappreciated. We really appreciate it. And God bless you for all you do. Thank you. I'll see you in the next podcast.